Welcome to The Objective Dad. Today is Sunday, September 11th, 2022. My name is Matt, and today we're going to talk about a project that has been near and dear to my heart for about two years now. One of the things that wasn't obvious to me was that there was a lot of useful things that came out of the cluster itself. It wasn't just a learning project. It was something that I could start using day to day for my own side projects and just learning more about cloud first technologies in general. And to give you an idea of some of the things that are running on there are, you know, MariaDB. I have Apache Airflow for orchestration. I have Apache Spark fully running in uh, Kubernetes with uh, Delta Lake, you know, heads up to Databricks for making that available in open source. Uh, I also have a full CI CD pipeline with uh, uh, Git T and Jenkins and uh, container registry I have running in the cluster. So there's a lot of different things that are now available to me that uh, I can you know, use, again, for my own experimentation and just to learn about how it all communicates and uh, is put together. The project was challenging on a number of fronts. And what I wasn't prepared for when I first started was Putting together a fully functional cluster took a lot of planning and consideration. So, you know, me not really knowing too much about Kubernetes and uh, the technologies involved, I had to kind of redo things frequently. Um, you know, sometimes I went on rabbit trails that were not fun. For example, I just wanted to get going at the beginning and get the cluster up and running, but I had to spend a couple weeks just worrying about what does the storage subsystem look like? You know, I didn't really want to use NFS. So I did a little bit of research and uh, a friend and colleague recommended uh, Ceph. So I have a separate video about, about that and how it's all set up. But that was just one of those rabbit trails that I went down, you know, for, for a length of time that, uh, that took me off of my main objective. But again, it was a learning project. So I, uh, I wanted to spend the time and, and do it the right way. Ironically, one of the easiest parts of the project was just physically assembling the, uh, the the cluster and getting the Raspberry Pis to kind of work and communicate in a way. I have a very amateur background with electronics, so I wasn't you know I didn't really do anything too crazy. Um, but uh, you know once I got the thing assembled, it was it, it really became obvious that I, I I had some real work ahead of me to, to to actually get it up and running and get a fully functional cluster. So the rest of this video is going to be a real high level overview of what the cluster looks like and how I put the uh, put the different pieces and parts together. Um, I will reference wherever possible the uh, the part numbers and uh, where to get them if you wanted to try your own build. And uh, I'll just call out over any of the gotchas and, uh, and, and kind of important lessons learned. So. This is a photograph of one of the modules. And as you can see over here, there's, uh, there, there's a few things that I've done and I uh, just wanted to kind of call out in case you have a similar build or experience similar problems. So first and foremost, I have the Raspberry Pi itself mounted to um, mounted to these uh, little acrylic slats that actually go inside of the case. And uh, as you can see, I, uh, I I try to do my best to to, to label them down here. And um, also each uh, each node has a uh, 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 a MAC address, obviously for the for for the Ethernet. Um, the reason why I wanted to kind of print that out and keep track of it is. Each one of these Raspberry Pis is assigned a static IP address by my by my router, so um, just made it a little bit easier to kind of keep track of what's what by, uh, by by labeling the card itself. Highly recommend that, by the way, because aside from you know the initial setup, once I screwed this thing on to the uh, uh, to this little acrylic board, I really didn't have any reason to remove it. Um, even to swap out the uh, um, the SD cards, you know, you can just pull it right out of the back. As you can see here, there's uh, there's a few different things that uh, uh, don't come with the Raspberry Pi. Uh, you'll notice I have this uh, Power Over Ethernet hat, and this one's from uh, Lover Lover Pi. Uh, I know there's a newer model out that's available now that can um, pull more wattage. And um, to be honest, I thought about upgrading these, but uh, but I really haven't had any power issues. So uh, the the Lover Pi hat has been uh, has has been good enough for what I want. And it just, as you can kind of see, it just drops right on top of the four, the the four pin header over here, which is the power over Ethernet. And uh, there's some circuitry um, and uh, voltage regulation that's going on here, and it basically connects it to the the, the correct pins on the GPIO. Uh, I think it's grabbing six here just for stability because the hat sits right on top of the board itself. 
one of the really nice things that I like about the, the lover pie hat is that um, you can kind of see here in the photograph, there's actually a header here and it carries through uh, both uh, five volt and 3.3 volt and ground so you can connect an external fan. Um, and that's basically making those pins available that it's, uh, that, it, that it's grabbing hold of up here. And I actually use these to power my fans. Um, I'm using the 3.3 volt just because the rig doesn't really get that hot. Um, it was just a nice little feature here that uh, there's a little external jumper here that I can you know, plug the, uh, uh, the case fans into. Moving on to the heat sinks. You can see I, I got these from Amazon. They're just uh, uh, real simple aluminum heat sinks. They, comes in pack, they come in packs of three. And this big heat sink is uh, over the uh, system on a chip. This is really the, 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 the critical piece. So if you can imagine, there's a, there's a fan that's kind of blowing air in through the back. And you just want to be careful about how you orient the fins because if I turn this uh, 90 degrees on its side, you know, you don't want the front row to really block the airflow. You want to make sure that the airflow is going to pass through these channels to, to, to really maximize, you know, how much air moves through and carries the heat away from the heat sink. Um, so just kind of calling that out here. Um, one of the things that uh, you do sacrifice a little bit with this power over ethernet hat is um, I think this is the system memory on the Raspberry Pi. I actually have a heat sink for these two, but as you can see this, uh, it, there's just a little too much overhang to, uh, to, to fit uh, a heat sink on. Um, you could probably get one, you know, that to, to put in here, but uh, to be honest, like I said, overheating hasn't been a problem for me. So I just left this off. Um, I, I did have a, uh, there's another IC here. I did kind of stick that heat sink on. Again, just pay attention to how the fins are oriented. Uh, jumping back over to the, the power over ethernet hat, I, I wanna just pay special attention to, um, to this IC right here. Um, I, I think there's, I, I, honestly, I don't know what this does, but it gets hot. And when you get, when you buy these, it comes with a little tiny copper heat sink on it. And I actually had one overheat um, and it actually ruined the, uh, the, the POE hat. So what I ended up doing is I pulled that heat sink, heat sink off and I actually just put a bigger one on here. I don't have a photograph of it and, uh, don't really feel like pulling the, pulling it out to take another picture, but just take my word for it. Um, you know, I, this does get hot. And, uh, and, and, and like I said, I just put another heat sink on here and I haven't had any problems with overheating really since, since that. And as you can kind of see up here in the little uh, text box. Uh, so where did I get this piece of acrylic? Um, this is actually a, um, comes with the uh, Cloudlet case from C4 Labs. I, I know there's other options out there for cases. Um, this was one that I found on Amazon that was, uh, that was in my price range at the time. And uh, I, I'm mostly happy with it. So if I kind of go over here, there's a, there's a stock picture of what it looks like. I can just kind of drop it in over here. Um, so again, this is from their website. It's uh, C4 Labs, and this is the uh, the color's a little bit different, but you can kind of see how they designed it to to put in here. Um, there are you know Raspberry Pis mounted on these little inserts. Um, it's meant to fit a uh, um, power over Ethernet switch down here at the bottom. What's not shown in this photograph is you can kind of see back here there are spaces for for fans to uh, to, to to basically cool down the uh, the entire case. So. Um, that's what I had to work with. And um, I ended up doing a few different modifications to, 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 to the setup itself. So if I just pull in another picture over here, this is a photograph of what my rig ended up looking like when, when all is said and done. And, and obviously you can see I, I, I did quite a few modifications and, and I'll get into that a little bit, but uh, one of the problems that I found right away with the design of this case is that it uses a very clever system to put these cards in. It uses pressure on the acrylic, but unfortunately what happened to several of these is there just wasn't enough pressure to snap these in. So the cards ended up falling out. So what I did is I ended up turning them on the side, as, as you can see here, and um, I ended up putting these foam spacers in here. So these do two things. Uh, number one, it holds the cards in really nice and or nice and snug, um, but it also creates a channel that um, th that the air flows through. I think uh, a little bit better. I, I did notice a temperature decrease once I put these uh, these foam spacers in, a and again, I just don't have as much air kind of blowing out of the bottom of the case, and it, and it forces the airflow 
through all the critical components of each of the pies. So, so that was kind of a, 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 a good a good design decision, I think, that uh, um, hopefully they can incorporate something like this into future versions of the Cloudlet case. But um, again, this is a do-it-yourself project. I'm here to learn, and, uh, um, and, and these foam spacers work just fine for me. So if I look at the layout of the rig itself, you can see all the different power over Ethernet cables. You can see I'm trying to do uh, a little bit of uh, cable lacing here, which I'm... I'm still practicing a little bit. Um, this uh, isn't the first time I've done lacing cables, but believe it or not, this is the best looking that I've done. So we'll definitely keep working on that. Um, but again, these are just power delivery coming from my uh, Netgear switch. That's a PoE Plus, and it just goes right up. And obviously each one of these, as I showed in the photograph here, has this power over ethernet hat that is uh, um, powering the Pi. So from a cabling standpoint, pretty clean. Um, over here, I have a, a somewhat different setup. You can see that there's six drives that are wired into the remaining bays of the case. Um, these are six one terabyte SSDs. And basically they are plugged in, if you just kind of look at the wires over here to the USB 3 interfaces of three of these pies here in the middle. And these are dedicated storage. And uh, um, I'll kind of get into the reasons why I, I wanted to do it this way in a little bit, but um, there's really no uh, Kubernetes or other cluster services here. These are these are designated storage. Uh, they're running Ceph, and uh, um, uh, again, I'll kind of get into the the, the 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 design and some of the considerations for that in a little bit. But these are these are 100% storage. Nothing else is running on them. And and also note that these are the Raspberry Pi 8 gigabyte models. So I needed the extra memory to really have a a, a workable storage subsystem. And these supply storage for every other node in the uh, in the cluster. I hope you enjoyed this introduction to my Raspberry Pi Kubernetes cluster. Uh, rest assured, this is going to be the first video of uh, several. There's a lot of different aspects that I really haven't even touched on yet, from services running there to deployments to or to uh, porting things over to uh, the ARM64 architecture and multi-arch builds, uh, setting up the registry, monitoring, alerting. There's a lot of different dimensions to this. So if you uh, uh, find any of these areas of interest to kind of help me prioritize the content, love to hear from you if you leave a comment below. Uh, until then, I will see you in the next one.